Our speaker is Brother Rolf Ruffner. We introduced him earlier, originally from Monahan, Texas. He is now presently speaking and working with Danny Douglas at the Central Church of Christ, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. And he is a member of the adjunct faculty of Columbia State Community College as a history teacher. We're grateful that he could come our way. And I know he has much to say to us on the fatal error that the Holy Spirit is not deity or a person. I hope one thing that's coming from all of these is that we're realizing as we study and refute the error how much we're just learning about actually what the Bible teaches on the Holy Spirit. And that I think is a side benefit from all of this. So please, Brother Ruffner, come and speak to us on this subject. I hope so. <laughs> no, I'm my mother's son. I know that. <laughs> Good to be with you again and with these fine brethren that have assembled from many different places. It's always go, good to go with the Brethren Spring that remain a light unto the world, if not this area. It's a wonderful thing to be with faithful brethren, as the Bible says, of like-minded faith. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Apostle Paul in the Holy Spirit says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, in the latter times some shall depart part from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons. This amazing verse, when you think about it, the Apostle Paul, who was not only an apostle, but he was a prophet, emphasizes the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, had communicated to him expressly. That means in stated terms, the ongoing apostasy that would be a go along with the growth of the church and still does the future of Christianity is also there will be apostasy. There will be people that fall away. And that's not in just, it wasn't just intended for the first century. That was intended for the 21st century too. And it seems like every day that passes some different heresy pops up in the religious ferment that we have today in our culture. It seems like the more people you have, of course, we have, what is seven billion and counting? Almost that number of, of heresies come along, too. Really, case in point is the top of our lesson, lecture today, divinity of the Holy Spirit or the, Holy, the fatal error that the Holy Spirit is not deity or a person. Even the Holy Spirit, which, of course, is the ultimate author of the Holy Bible, 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2021, cannot escape abuse, and it surely does not today. Here's a quote from the denomination, their website, the United Church of God, about the Holy Spirit. It says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of God and of Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the power of God and the Spirit of life eternal. Now, on the surface of that, oh, yeah. No, no, what are they doing? They are denying the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Yet they also claim they have, as we've talked about in this lecture, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not divine to them. It's just a spirit. Well, they were influenced by some spirit. I would say the spirit of error, as John talks about. But, it, but not by the Holy Spirit. Now... Who is the Holy Spirit? I know this may have been covered in some of the lectures, and uh, please bear with us today as we go around. There may be some of us like myself that haven't heard some of this. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is a, is a member of the Godhead, or to use a word not found in the Bible, the Trinity. He is that part of that three, that triumphant of deity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Holy Spirit tells us in Paul, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That is a powerful verse, not just what we're talking about today specifically, but many, on many points. 
But you know, you ask that question, who is the Holy Spirit? You must begin by asking, well, who is God? God is not just some sentient being. That means a, a, a being that is aware, but a spiritual being, a divine personality. In John 4, verse 24, there Jesus told the woman at the well, a very unlikely conversation, said, you must worship God, worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. When Moses asked God who he was, great question. Because he wanted to know what he would tell the children of Israel who had sent him. God said, I am that I am. And he said, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am sent me unto you. Exodus 3 verse 14. You know, that challenges my mind. Hope it does yours to comprehend what that really means. We know God is the creator of the universe. Genesis 1 verse 1. We know the concept, but the, rather the concept of one who has always existed and always will exist, well, it's just beyond complete grasping. We, they can grasp it to an extent, but it's still an amazing thought. Moses wrote about God, before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou didst, hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalm 90, verse 2. But if that wasn't complex enough, the Godhead is in many ways yet a more complex idea. God is composed of three persons, not three personalities, or one immortal being, of one more immortal being, or one divine being with three names. I've heard that. When Moses was talking about the creation of the universe in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. He carefully climaxes this creative power of God in creation, in the creation of man, when he says, and God said, let us, let, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Interesting. Divine triune. The Godhead, us, creates a triune being. As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, when he talks about the soul and the spirit and the body, might be blessed, man. The Bible reveals that all three members of the Godhead were involved in creation. The Father, the Word, or Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All three were involved. As we mentioned, the Holy Spirit is often regulated to inferior status in the Godhead by some people, by some religious groups. But as Genesis 1 tells us, verse 26, makes clear to us the, the us. God is plural, includes all three members of the Godhead were present there at creation. This plural plurality here is repeated when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. It says, and the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand... Also, and also take the tree of life and eat and live forever and ever. Man is that great achievement of those di divine persons of the Godhead. Us. That he might be like us. The New Testament brings together the divinity and the names composed in the Godhead many times. One of the greatest examples is Matthew 28 verse 19. Where Jesus says, go ye therefore, teaching on, teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, comma, and of the Son, comma, and of the Holy Ghost. Baptism brings us into that covenant relationship with the Godhead. All three members of the Godhead were present when Jesus was baptized. Of course, the Son was there. The Father spoke. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Also, Paul in his epistle emphasizes the Christian's connection to the Godhead. Notice this verse, Romans 15, verse 30. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Three. Here's another one. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all, amen. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Paul believed it. Paul taught it. But it's necessary that we, is it necessary that we know anything about the Holy Spirit or the Godhead? Can't we just say, well, you know, that's just too big for me to grasp. Oh, and I'll just go ahead and love the Lord and go on, as people say. Apostle Paul discovered certain disciples, Acts 19, verse 1 at Ephesus. He said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? That was a penetrating question. Have you received it? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Acts 19, verse 2. Now that, that answer to that question was deficient. And Paul knew that. Revealed to Paul, these brethren were not brethren. They were disciples of John. He taught them the truth, and they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 19, verse 5, the American Standard Version said. Apostle Paul bestowed on them the miraculous gifts of the Spirit by the laying on of his hands. Brother H. Leo Bowles wrote, The teachings of the Godhead lie at the very heart of revealed truth. This teaching is the center from which all other tenets of faith radiate. Well, what happens if you have a distorted view of the Godhead. The distorted view of the Godhead leads to a distorted view of the Holy Spirit and a whole bunch of other doctrines. Some say, well, the Godhead is three manifestations of one deity. Others claim, well, there's three gods, as I mentioned in the beginning. Some take a, you either call this binary trinitarian or bi-Trinitarian. I've haven't figured that one out yet. But anyway, it's that view that the Holy Spirit is not deity but an it or a force from God. But the view of the Bible is that the Holy Spirit is God, co-eternal with God the Father and the Son. He's not the Father. He's not the Son. The third person or personage of the, whole, of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not the mind the temperament or the disposition of God, of the Godhead. And the Holy Spirit is not the Bible. He is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. You know, among all of us, there's this trait among human beings to name somebody. We have a name. What did Adam, what did Adam do? One of the things he did, he tended the garden, he named the animals. It's what sets us apart from others, what contributes to our personhood, our individuality. The Holy Spirit is first called the Spirit of God in the second verse of the Bible, in the first chapter. Adam, or the man, is first mentioned in the Bible, tending the garden, naming the animals. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is named with a masculine pronoun, always predominating. Notice this verse. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he, he, will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance what it's where I've said to you, Jesus promised his disciples in John 14, verse 26. Both the neuter and the masculine pronouns are used in this verse, but the masculine is presumed. An influence, a force, not just, does not have action. It does not have individuality. It does not have character. It doesn't have those things. Paul wrote, For he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit, to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Galatians 6, verse 8. The Spirit does something there, doesn't it? Holy Spirit is said to do certain things in the Bible which proves he has personality. He speaks and declares things through others. Matthew 10, verse 20. The Lord said, Where is not? He told his apostles. When you go out into the world, it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. John 16, verse 13. Last night of the Lord's life, he told his disciples, Howbeit when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall speak, that will he speak, and he will show you things to come. Personality. Declaring through others. Acts 2, verse 4, day of Pentecost. 
and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. Spirit speaking through someone. And finally, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Not an electrical force. A person. With that action in mind, we must not forget, it's been pointed out many times in this lectureship, the Holy Spirit is the true author of the Bible. Every word of the original autographs were given by God, by the Holy Spirit. He did this in conjunction with the other members of the Godhead. Note these verses. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We know that one, 2 Peter 1, verse 21. But notice what Paul says, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All spirit is given by inspiration of God. John 6, verse 63, a passage I love, where Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. All three members of the Godhead were involved there in the, the inspiration of the Bible. The Holy Spirit also searches and knows things. But God hath revealed unto us, 1 Corinthians 2, Paul tells us, revealed unto us by his Spirit, speaking of himself and the apostles. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are given to us by God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 through 12. Only a person could search and know something, Right? He shows his divinity, the Holy Spirit does, because he searches and he knows that mind, that infinite mind of God. An electrical force, a powerful influence could do that. The Holy Spirit works in the lives of his brethren too. Notice this. The New Testament period, church history, what some have called the, the dispense, dispensation of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit bestowed certain miraculous gifts on his brethren to confirm the word that they had taught and wrote. We talked about this this morning. Think about this. I hadn't thought about this until I studied it for this lecture. By determining which gift to give and whom it was given required intelligence, determination, ability to direct the apostles in conferring those gifts. Think about this. You think the apostle Paul says, well, look, you know, you, you need the gift of tongues over here. You need the gift of this. It was the Holy Spirit working through Paul. The Holy Spirit loves us. Again, we go to this verse, Romans 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for the love of the Spirit, that you strive with me in your prayers to God for me. That's an act of a person. Not an impersonal force, not an influence, but a person. The Holy Spirit intercedes for the children of God. Notice this verse. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth us in our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as for as we want, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to his will. Romans 8, verse 26-27. Holy Spirit strives with men. Isaiah 63, verse 10, Isaiah talking about the rebellious, his rebellious generation that he lived in. He said, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. That's not the actions of impersonal force without emotion, is it? To strive with someone. The Holy Spirit has fellowship with Christians. Philippians 2, verse 1 and 2. If therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Just as we have fellowship, if we're Christians, with the Father and the Son, so we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Here the Holy Spirit did something in this passage and others. And he continues to do something. The 
Holy Spirit also is shown that he comforts by the word of God. Notice what Luke says in Acts 9, verse 31. Then had the churches rest through all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. How does he do that? Some feeling I've got or some bliss I get in my heart where I smile all of a sudden. Reminds me of little babies that, you know, they, they get a gas pain, they start smiling all of a sudden, and they start frowning. No, he does that through the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. He causes David to laugh. No, no, I'm kidding. Okay. And you know, the Holy Spirit, like a person, can be mistreated and abused. You know, one thing that's amazed me when I read the Bible is how, how much God has emotions like you and I do. Not exactly the same. He's God, obviously. But he does feel. The Holy Spirit does too. The Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. Matthew 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, the Lord said, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven unto men. Blasphemy may refer to slander, distraction, speech injurious to another's health. Impious and reproachful speech, injurious to others. Now, one presidential candidate the other day, <clears throat> someone said something he didn't like. He said, I'm going to sue you. Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Brother Michael Hatcher wrote in his track about the Holy Spirit. He said, by the usage of this word in uh, Matthew 12, verse 31, Jesus shows us the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is a person and he is God. The Holy Spirit can be lied to. I think one of the most remarkable passages in the book of Acts, besides Acts 2, obviously, is Acts 5, where Ananias and Sapphira conspire together to lie to the apostles. And Peter says, when Ananias comes in and tells him the lie, he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled th thine heart to be to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? And he was dead. The Holy Spirit can be resisted. Stephen, when he stood that wonderful sermon in Acts chapter 7, that brave sermon, for all the, that crowd, hostile crowd, he said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, why do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did? So do ye, Acts 7 verse 51. My friends, people still resist the Holy Spirit when they resist obeying God's word, whatever it may be. They resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit likewise can be grieved. Ephesians 4 verse 20, Paul reminds the Ephesians, he said, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God <clears throat> by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Ephesians 4 verse 20. I came across this quote about this verse by uh, commentator Matthew Henry. He said, by looking to what proceeds and to what follows, we may see what it is that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. In the previous verses, it is intimated that all lewdness and filthiness and lying and corrupt communications that stir up filthy appetites and lusts grieves the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. It would follow, it is intimated, that these corrupt passions of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, clamor and evil speaking and malice grieve this good spirit. Think about that. Think how the grief the Holy Spirit is in our very time that we live. You hear him blasphemed and, and all the filthiness and lying and corrupt communication, corrupt lives. But you know it grieves him. All that happens. Holy Spirit can be insulted. Hebrews 10 verse 21. How much more worse punishment do you suppose will be brought or rather thought worthy, worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, count the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. That's from the King James Version. All these passages show us that the Holy Spirit is a person, a divine person, not an it, impersonal force. There is no such thing as an impersonal God, is there? God is personal. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Holy Spirit is that way too. John 10 verse 35, Jesus said, and the scriptures cannot be broken. 
Now, the Holy Spirit is divine. We don't know that already. When we read the scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament, we notice that he is eternal and self-existent. He is God. And notice these similarities. Like the Father and the Son, he is omniscient or all-wise. Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who hath directed the Spirit of God, or being his counselor, hath taught him. Paul quotes that again. 1 Corinthians uh, 2, verse 10, 11. We quote this earlier, but let's do it again. But God hath revealed unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? So the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. He's all wise. He is omnipresent, all-powerful. Job says, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed in the crooked serpent. Job 26, 13. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He is all-powerful. He is also omnipresent. That means he is anywhere in time and space. David said in Psalm 139, verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Paul says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which is of God, and you are not your own? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Many other attributes Holy Spirit shares with the Godhead. Just to mention a few. He is called the Spirit of Life, Romans 8, verse 2. Life ultimately comes from deity. John 3, verse 6. Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. We talk, talked a little bit about that today. He's referred to as the Spirit of Truth. John 16, verse 13, by Jesus himself. And Jesus declares truth is an attribute of God and of the Bible, of the Father and the Bible. John 17, verse 17, thy word is truth. Jesus prayed to God. Another attribute is Christians are the object of his love, as we talked about. Holy Spirit is called holy. Holy Spirit, because holiness is an essential attribute of each person of the Godhead. Wonderful it is to be a Christian. How wonderful it is to know better the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But I must say that some religious groups have gone a long way from that. Let's look at some religious groups who reject the divinity of the Holy Spirit. One is the Jehovah Witnesses, the Watchtower Society, a cult. There was a cult, that's a cult which was formed in 1870 by Charles Taze Russell, that I believe one of our brethren, did, did he debate him, I think? I think that's right, before he got killed in an accident. These people don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in only Jehovah, the universal king, with Jesus a created being, an exalted archangel, the archangel Michael. That's who Jesus is, a created being. And the Holy Spirit is just some impersonal force out there that kind of emanates from them. Notice this, this uh, quote from their, their magazine, The Watchtower. It says, There is a close connection between the Holy, small caps here, Holy Spirit and the power of God. The Holy, small caps, is the means by which Jehovah exerts his power. Put simply, the Holy Spirit is God's applied power or his active force. You know, Paul and Barnabas didn't know that. Paul and Barnabas, when, when they were sent out by the Holy Spirit on their first missionary journey, the Bible records, Holy Spirit said to the church there at Antioch, he said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein I have called them, Acts 13, verse 2. Wayne Jackson says, the text affirms that the Spirit said certain things. Moreover, the first person pronoun, me, is used of the one speaking. This was not a force. This was a person speaking. Separate out me, Paul and Barnabas. Jehovah's Witness also claimed that the baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 18, I mean 28, verse 19, does not prove anything. It doesn't prove deity. 
since the name of implies authority and not a person. Well, you know, when, when uh, we know when John West comes and knocks on David's door and says, open up in the name of the law. We know what that means, don't we? <laughs> but while it does refer to power and authority, it also shows a person's name or individuality, such as the phrase, open up in the name of the law. What law? Applies a source of law, a king, whatever. Matthew 28, verse 19, the name Holy Spirit is associated with the persons of the Godhead. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Brother Roy Lanier, Sr. wrote, Baptism is an act of worshipful obedience to the person unto whose name one is baptized. A force would not share God's name, would it? A force would not share God's name. Another group here, the United Church of God, came from that old heresy put out by Worldwide Church of God with Herbert W. Armstrong. We were hearing him as a kid. He'd, he'd get on the radio and they'd announce the world tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong. And he had this blur voice and kind of rang as went along. Was founded, uh, the Worldwide Church of God was founded by Herbert W. Armstrong, a false prophet. And they believe strongly, they believe that the God has composed only of the Father and the Son. And notice to what they, says here, they say here. This is the United Church of God that came out of that when he passed away and uh, his son didn't work out too well. They kind of splintered. But anyway, he said, Common to Trinitarian teaching, Scripture reveals the Holy Spirit not as a person, but as something much different, the divine power through which God acts. Now, he goes on, in attempting to prove their point, they refer to many Old Testament, New Testament verses, I'm talking about this, which speak of power. Yet, by so doing, they disprove their false doctrine. Divine power is attributed to the Godhead. It denotes divinity of the one who exhibited. Power is exhibited by all three persons of the Godhead. They are all omnipotent or all powerful. Like Paul said, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, where is the power of God and salvation those who believe. The Jew first and also the Greek. Jesus, in Matthew 18, verse 18, or 28, verse 18, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven on earth. Romans 15, verse 19, Paul describing his work. He says, through many signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit. So from Jerusalem around about unto Jerusalem, I have preached the gospel of Christ. Another group that came out of Worldwide Church of God, the Armstrongites, was the Living Church of God, founded by Roderick Meredith in, 18, in 1989. They deny also the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Notice this. The Holy Spirit is not a being and is considered the very essence, the mind, and the power of God. Now let's look at another heresy. That's put out by the Oneness Pentecostals. There's, they go by various names, United Pentecostal and many others. Also don't believe in, in the, or they also are non-Trinitarian. And here's a quote from them. The Father and the Holy Spirit are one and the same God. The Holy Spirit is not a being. and is considered the very essence, the mind, the power of God. I know someone else is dealing with that, so I'll let that be. But let's look at one more here, one or two more. One is the Church of Christ, scientist. Always thought that name was interesting. Church of Christ, comma, scientist or Christian Science, founded in 1879 by Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy taught that the Holy Spirit is equivalent with divine science, the teaching of Christian science. And here's a quote from her. In the words of St. John, He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This comforter I understand to be divine science. She doesn't read her Bible. She picked up this phrase and that phrase and mixed them together. Of course, the Bible teaches that the Comforter, John 14, verse 26, was not the teachings of Christian science, but the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. In this passage, Jesus shows the divinity, the, the equal, equality of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit by referring to him as another Comforter because Jesus is a Comforter also, isn't he? 
Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come unto me. And my favorite here is Mormonism, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which at the beginning was called the Church of Christ, by the way, because they were, Sidney Rigdon affected them some way, and then they changed it a couple of times. They ended up with Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the LDS. They've had conflicting views on the Holy Spirit for a long time, of course, founded by Joseph Smith, Jr. in 1830. Their early authorities, as they call them, tried to distinguish between the Holy Ghost as the third person of the Godhead and the Holy Spirit as God's presence or essence. One of Smith's original apostles, James Talmadge, wrote, He, the Holy Ghost, is being endowed with the, with the attributes and powers of deity, not a mere force or essence. Another apostle... Parley Pratt wrote that the Holy Spirit was a force like a divine fluid or an impersonal ener energy. Many recent authorities, though, they, in, within, the, within the LDS church, you, they agree. They, they say, well, you know, those terms, Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost, they're synonymous. Here's a quote from their website. The Holy Spirit is a term often used to refer to the Holy Ghost. In such cases, the Holy Spirit is a person. His ghost is an old English word meaning spirit. Now they, as the, as the Mormons do often, they did a swisheroo here. They disposed their earlier false doctrine. Because Mormonism is a continuing revelation. I guess they wake up, their prophets wake up every morning to a new world. You know, they come up with a new revelation. No. There's others we could talk about, the Christ, Christadelphians and so forth. But you know, I've just touched the, the hem of the garment on this when it comes to the deity and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that folks that believe this will repent of it deny, and realizing they're denying the deity of God. Again, Brother H. Leo Bowes wrote, it's a grievous sin against the Holy Spirit to refuse or deny that the Bible teaches what the Bible teaches about the personality of the Holy Spirit. To deny what the New Testament teaches or his personality is deny the testimony of Christ. But when you go into this, when you get into this minefield of religious error, anything can happen. It may be, I believe it all comes back to their misunderstanding of the scriptures. They forget that not only we must read the scriptures, we must understand and must rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. But when you combine religious enthusiasm, which a lot of people have, and subjectivism, you have a very lethal brew, don't you? As Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. My friends, you need to give up all that. Go back to, to the Bible. Not traditions of men, not to your feelings. Change your mind, change your spiritual condition. Many have through the ages. One man wrote this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who changed his mind. He said, And when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Acts 26, verse 14. Today, we need to ask ourselves, those that believe this false doctrine, who are you kicking against in your life? Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Roth, for that interesting study. Uh, I think anybody that approaches a study of Godhead is in for a challenging study. And to do our best to understand it, it will take our best. And we appreciate what he's done, and I hope that you will realize the value of that chapter in the book and helping you when you're maybe preparing for some lesson regarding deity, and that it will be of help in that way.